Hare Krishna. Why not? We'll find it. Hare Krishna, we're going to do a Bhagavatam class. Now, in the first canto of the Bhagavatam. I'll tell you in a moment. 199 is the verse. So can we turn off that uh, the Very chanting there in the yeah, kitchen? Yeah. So, Krishna, uh, we are um, Going to read from Prabhupada's Bhagavatam, uh, first canto, chapter nine, text nine. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So I'll read the verse. Tan Sametan Mahabhagan Upalabhya Vasuta Maha. Puja Yamasa Dharma Gyo Desha Kala Vibhagavit. Translation Bhishma Dev, who was the best among the eight Vasus, received and welcomed all the great and powerful Rishis who were assembled there. For he knew perfectly all the religious principles according to time and place. Prabhupada's purport Expert religionists know perfectly well how to adjust religious principles in terms of time and place. All the great acharyas or religious preachers or reformers of the world executed their mission by adjustment of religious principles in terms of time and place. There are different climates and situations in different parts of the world. Different climates and situations in different parts of the world. And if one has to discharge his duties to preach, Lord's message, he must be expert, expert in adjusting things in terms of the time and place. Bhishma Dei was one of the 12 great authorities in preaching this cult of devotional service, and therefore he could receive and welcome all the powerful sages assembled there at his deathbed from all parts of the universe. He was certainly unable at that time to welcome and receive them physically because he was neither at his home nor in a normal healthy condition, but he was quite fit by the activities of his sound mind, and therefore he could utter sweet words with hearty expressions, and all of them were well received. One can perform one's duty by physical work, by mind and by words, and he knew well how to utilize them in the proper place, and therefore there was no difficulty for him to receive them, although physically unfit. That's Prabhupada's purport. So, this is Vasutama, Bhijma, at the end of his life on earth. And he's described as Dharma Gya. He knew Dharma, or he knew uh, the proper principles of life, how to act in different situations. And specifically, he's called here Desha Kala Vibhagavit. Desha, Desha, of course, means place, Kala is time, Vibhaga, differences or divisions, distinctions. Vit, he knew. He knew that times and places are different. Prabhupada says there are different climates and situations in different parts of the world. And if one has to discharge his duties to preach the Lord's message, 
He must be expert in adjusting things in terms of the time and place. So obviously that is our challenge. Um, we are at a somewhat bizarre time and place in the modern world. Uh, just uh, to mention some of the well-known cliches. Um, the digital age, just uh, the condition of the world. Of course, is is very different than it is now, than it was. So, Krishna. Um, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, "Matatsmiti um, jnana mukohanam cha." The knowledge comes from me, memory. Krishna also told Arjun, Mayai Lai Te Nihata Purvameva. I have already killed all these soldiers, all these warriors. Mayai Lai Te Nihata Purvameva. Nimitta Matam Bhava Savya Sachin. You, Savya Sachin, just be the instrument. So the art of devotional service. The art of becoming Krishna's instrument. Just like if you have to do some work, you go into your toolbox and you look for the right tool. And you may pass over some tools, like, no, like that's got a dull blade, or that one doesn't work very well, it's the wrong tool. And so, in a sense, we are all sitting in Krishna's Sankirtan toolbox. And so, the real secret of devotional service is somehow rather to, the way I put it sometimes, to have your Rudolph moment. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, then one foggy Christmas Eve, you know that song? No, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, you don't know that. So anyway, the idea here is that um, the whole secret of devotional service is somehow or other uh, please Krishna so that Krishna chooses to empower us. And of course, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that he reciprocates with everything. So, presumably, if our desire is sincere enough and strong enough, Krishna will empower us to uh, rebuild Prabhupada's Western Hare Krishna movement. Those who are, um, those who somehow or other, by their own destiny, by Krishna's arrangement, those who are living in the Western world, uh, should know, if their eyes are open, uh, the condition of the Hare Krishna movement in the Western world. And the, uh, to put it mildly, we are not an important movement. We are not a major spiritual or cultural force in the Western world, and that's, well, that's just the least of it. So every day we chant Prabhupada's Pranam Mantra, Paschatya Deshatarine, Savior of the Western countries. Prabhupada wrote that mantra. And so somehow or other, we have to be like Bhishma. We have to be like Bhishma and uh, understand time and place. Where are we? Because some people are succeeding. It's not that no one is succeeding. And of course, I, I think another, we don't want to be discouraged. We have to be encouraged. We have to look for promising signs. But at the same time, uh, we should not be, how should I put it, self-delusional. Sometimes we find that devotees will tell each other little anecdotes which show that actually the movement is going well and actually people are accepting it and there are all these signs and okay. But at the end of the day, uh, nothing seems to change very much. 
despite all these pep talks and encouraging signs and stories and anecdotes. And I mean, we have lots of anecdotes. We just don't have a big movement. So what's really needed is to uh, ultimately somehow or other to get Krishna's mercy. Because as Krishna told Arjun, uh, could we, I think we close this curtain here. It'll, it'll be easier for people to see. Yeah, yeah, that's better. So, of course, there are the, so to speak, the intangibles. For example, the quality of our chanting. Because Lord Chaitanya emphasized this verse, Hare Nama, Hare Nama, Hare Nama, Eva Kevalam. So there's no gati, there's no movement, there's no progress. So when we chant Hare Krishna, can that kitchen work on after the cleanse? Yeah. The um, because when you chant Hare Krishna, only Krishna knows the quality of, our, of your chanting. We can be in a kirtan and, you know, dancing or banging on the drum or banging on the cartels and everyone can think that we're, you know, I'm an enthusiastic devotee, but am I really focused on Krishna? Am I just having a good time with my friends doing kirtan? To what extent am I really deeply focused on Krishna internally? Because surrender... I mean, sometimes it's external, like if Krishna asks you to do something that you may not want to do, but, you know, you should do it. And so there are external events which require surrender. And there are internal events. The quality of our chanting, whether we really pray to Krishna, whether we remember Krishna. And so a big part of bhakti yoga is not visible to our friends and associates. It's just between Krishna and ourselves. And so we, I mean, it's possible to behave in a certain way that everyone thinks, oh, you're really a good devotee. But internally, uh, we may or may not be actually surrendering. There's also a, you could call it a bhakti yoga comfort zone where we're not really uh, stretching, so to speak, to use a yoga analogy since it's kind of, you know, Hatha Yoga is now a huge part of Wisconsin outreach. Because obviously no one, only those who are trying to improve their bodies through yoga could possibly be candidates for devotional service. But anyway, um, hey, all right, Krishna Sanvi, you want to take over the class? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, time will tell and if we look at the history of Lord Chaitanya's movement when Lord Chaitanya came of course there was a, the original Hare Krishna explosion when Lord Chaitanya came and he spread his movement as only he could and history shows that even after Lord Chaitanya left this world there was it went on, the movement grew very quickly, it was very powerful, it had real influence in many parts of India, and then it fell upon hard times. So after a very outstanding career, really, of, of major achievements, it fell upon hard times and uh, became very small. And as we know, history repeats itself. So, and of course, we have to keep up our spirits. We have to keep up our enthusiasm. But at the same time, sometimes we can keep our spirits up so much that we just sort of, uh, we don't really pay attention to the problem. It's like someone can have a problem that really needs to be addressed. It could be a medical problem. And then the person may say, well, no, I believe in positive thinking. I'm not going to worry about those things, you know. I want to 
and everyone can encourage them, yes, just be positive. But meanwhile, you really need to go to a doctor. So positive thinking is nice, but not as an excuse for actually facing reality. So we, we need to take a really hard look at where we stand in the marketplace, so to speak, because we're not the only people who are trying to attract the hearts and minds of the people. There are many, many groups. There are many, many people who want to spread their movement. And are we really, Prabhupada, of course, placed extraordinary emphasis. I quoted many, many quotes from Prabhupada, quoted Prabhupada in my Vyas yes, Puja offering this year, in which he emphasized very strongly the need to attract local people. Like whatever country you're in, you have to attract the local people. And uh, he emphasized this all over the world, in America, in Australia, in Africa, in Europe, everywhere he went. He kept emphasizing that, that that's the real success for a movement. Because the real purpose, the reason Prabhupada got on the boat, the Jaladupta, was because he understood the geopolitical reality of the world. He understood America was a leading country, despite some bizarre political events in the last few years. It's a leading country in the world, and... Um, And therefore, he said, if America becomes Krishna conscious, or if the Americans are just even a significant number, which could be, I mean, 1% of the people in this country seriously accepted Krishna consciousness, uh, that would be 3.3 million Western devotees. It's a lot of cartels from, who's gonna polish all the cartels? Oh, your job. So, so that that would that would be three point three million or more, whatever the population is now, um, devotees. That'd just be one percent. And I mean, the whole world would feel it. So I've been trying to it's to sort of alert people to this. It's not always the most fun thing to do because some people think, oh, why, you know. You should just look at the positive and, and everything's fine. Everything, I mean, I actually have devotees tell me everything's really going well. And, uh, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, I was with Prabhupada. I traveled around America. I know what he told me. I know what his vision was. And uh, we need to fix something. Very soon. And so here, B, uh, Bhishma. I should, I should read another purport from Prabhupada. <laughs> Shall we? Um, this is also from Prabhupada. Uh, this is Nard instructing Dhruva Maharaj. Nard instructing Dhruva Maharaj, two great Vaishnavas. And he tells him again, Desha Kalavi Bhagavit, same phrase. Prabhupada says in his purport, the method of worship, chanting the mantra and preparing the forms of the Lord, even deity worship, is not stereotyped, nor is it exactly the same everywhere. It is specifically mentioned in this verse that one should take consideration of the time, place, and available conveniences. Our Krishna conscious movement is going on throughout the entire world, and we also install deities in different centers. Some people, puffed up with concocted notions, criticize, he's talking about the way things are done in India, probably it says, actually it says sometimes our Indian friends, so it says, puffed up with concocted notions. And this went on in India, Prabhupada's being criticized. They criticized, this has not been done, that has not been done, but they forget this instruction of Narda Muni to one of the greatest Vaishnavas, Dhruva Maharaj. One has to consider the particular time, country, 
and conveniences. What is convenient in India may not be convenient in the Western countries. I'll read that again. What is convenient in India may not be convenient in the Western countries. Those who are, at, those who are not actually in the line of Acharyas or who personally have no knowledge of how to act in the role of Acharya unnecessarily criticize the activities of the ISKCON movement in countries outside of India. The fact is that such critics cannot do anything personally to spread Krishna consciousness. If someone does go and preach, taking all risks, taking all risks and allowing all considerations for time and place, allowing all considerations for time and place, it might be that there are changes in the manner of worship, but that is not at all faulty according to Shastra. So in chapter six of the Nectar of Devotion, Rupa Goswami makes a distinction, which Prabhupada translates and explains. Uh, actually, I'll do better than that. I'm going to, of course, charge you a little more, but I can read it to you. So, um, I'll actually read it to you for the next year. That's, there are advantages to the digital age. Let's see, uh, the books by Sri Prabhupada. The Nectar of Devotion. And this is chapter six, how to discharge devotional service. So let me read let, let, this is chapter six of the Nectar of Devotion. Sri Rupa Goswami states that his elder brother, Sanatan Goswami, has compiled Hari Bhakti Vilas, which has just hundreds and thousands of details and rituals. For the guidance of the Vaishnavas, and therein he has mentioned many rules and regulations to be followed by Vaishnavas. Some of them are very important and prominent. And Sri Rupa Goswami will now mention these very important items for our benefit. The purport of this statement is that Sri Rupa Goswami proposes to mention only basic principles, not details. For example, a basic principle is that one has to accept a spiritual master. Exactly how one follows the instructions of his spiritual master is considered a detail. For example, if one is following the instructions of his spiritual master, and that instruction is different from that of another guru. This is called detailed information. But the basic principle of acceptance of a spiritual master is good everywhere. Although the details may be different. This is a very crucial distinction which is often overlooked. And that is, we have two categories of rules, not one. It's not like chant Hare Krishna and, you know, I don't know, use a certain kind of chants in the doll or something. It's, you know, we can't think that it's just, they're just all the rules. You just have to follow the rules. No, Prabhupada says there's two categories of rules. One is basic principles that you have to follow, like Chan Hare Krishna. But then there are details which are variable. They may change according to time and place. Now, if you put everything in the same box, you think it's all basic, then that's not a spiritual science. It's just like if you're a doctor, there are life-threatening symptoms or conditions. If a patient is taken to the hospital, if something is life-threatening or potentially life-threatening, it has to be dealt with immediately. Oh, you're the doctor. Mm -hmm. Whereas something which is not life-threatening is not that serious. It, you know, maybe it, it, you know uncomfortable for the patient, but first they have to look at the life-threatening. So there are distinctions. So Prabhupada, I mean, Rupa Goswami and Prabhupada translating mentions these basic principles. Now, what's interesting is, as I was saying yesterday, that all kinds of ethnic things like dress you know, wearing certain kinds of quote-unquote devotional clothes, which is an incredibly non-Shastric term, but wearing, let's say, like devotional clothes or, or certain kinds of recipes or certain musical instruments, nowhere in the list. I mean, there's a first list and a next list. It's not that we can't do these things. It's not that it's bad to do these things. It's just not on the list of basic principles. 
And so to, to look at look at those things as basic principles is not to understand the spiritual science. That's the point. And so obviously if we put these two things together when the Bhagavatam says twice about Bhishma and then Narada instructing Dhruva, Desha Kala Vibhaga Vit, we have to understand differences of time and place. When Prabhupada says, for example, don't change anything, as he said, don't, and then when he says you should adjust everything, you have to be intelligent. You have to put those two things together. Clearly, when Prabhupada says don't change anything, he's talking about the basic principles. And clearly, when he says you should adjust everything, he's talking about the details. If we think details are basic principles, we are not spiritual scientists. And we're going to present to the public something which is just no one thinks is a spiritual science, which is kind of what's happening now in this country and in most Western countries that very few people recognize what we're doing as a spiritual science. And maybe one reason is that we need to get in shape. Maybe if we understood better what a spiritual science actually is and what it isn't, and maybe if we presented Krishna consciousness in a more rational way as a spiritual science, not as an ethnic tradition, uh, people might take us more seriously. I mean, imagine those, I mean, all of you practically, you come to America and you study, you know, pursue some career. I mean, what if you went to a university in America and said, that's not the way they do it at IIT? Or no, you know, I went to, the, I went to some university in India, no, we don't do it that way. That you would obviously very quickly terminate your career, right? And then, isn't that a fact? You're working for some company, you say, no, when I was in India, we didn't do it that way. So in any field of life, whether you're trying to spread Krishna consciousness or just advance your career, you have to know where you are. So, Some people, some devotees feel more Krishna conscious when they dress a certain way. That's okay. I mean, they have a right to do that. But to tell the public as a general rule that it is a spiritual science that you will be more God conscious if you dress this way, is that scientific? I don't think so. Shastra never says that. Guru Goswami never says that. I mean, in the idea, frankly, that you will love God more if you wear certain kinds of clothes, I mean, does that sound rational to you? I mean, obviously, we should wear decent clothes. Dressing decently is a principle, because that, that's a moral principle. One should dress decently. And, and, and that's what Krishna teaches in Bhagavad Gita. Krishna teaches in the Bhagavad Gita, Sattva Guna, offered to Krishna with devotion, it becomes Shuddha Sattva, it becomes purified goodness. And as I said in Bhagavad Gita 424, quoted last night, that Brahmarpana, when you make an arpana, when you make an offering to the Absolute, Brahma Arpana, when you make an offering to the Absolute, Brahma Havir, that which you offer, this is in chapter 4, that which you, Havir, of course, literally means ghee. But what Krishna does, we didn't get a chance to do all that in the Gita, uh, in the class yesterday, because I, uh, there's just so many things to say. But what Krishna, Krishna talks about offering, because he says that um, without offering, without doing sacrifice, this world is simply bondage. Loko yam karma bandana. This world is just the bondage of karma unless you offer sacrifice. And so when Krishna talks about sacrifice, he uses the classic 
language. He talks like Havir, Gi, or Agni, the fire. Agni, from which we have in this word ignite, by the way. So, so, so he's talking about the fire sacrifice, but immediately afterwards, he makes very clear that actually there are many kinds of sacrifices, like yogis, for example. You can make your mind the fire, and the Havir, you can offer uh, the sense activities into the fire of the mind, or, or what's that? Or you can offer um, the sense objects into the fire of the senses. So, so the, the classic sacrifice, where you have a fire, and a Brahman puts some ghee in the fire, that becomes symbolic. Many things can be the fire, and many things can be the ghee. But the principle, the underlying principle, is universal that you're offering. And so Krishna says, Brahmarpanam, in that same chapter, when you make an offering, um, Brahma Havir. Oh, thank you. I'll give you a tip later. <laughs> so, Brahmarpanam, Brahma Havir. That which you offer, the actual object that you offer, also becomes absolute. And this is what Prabhupada, I mean, Prabhupada translated this for us when he's talking about spiritualizing material things. Krishna is saying that if it's used in Krishna's service, it also becomes spiritual. Prabhupada talked about this, and, and the Gita verse, which explicitly states this, is 424. So, Brahmarpanam, when you make an offering to the Absolute, the actual thing you offer, whether it's your body, your energy, your mind, your money, um, you know, whatever, food, Whatever thing you actually offer to Krishna, it becomes spiritual. Brahmarpanam Brahma Havir Brahma no, because the because it's accepted by the absolute. The Agni, the fire, which ultimately represents Krishna, is spiritual. Brahmana Hutam, and you become spiritual. The person who made the offering. Oh, thank you. The, the person who made the offering also becomes Brahman, becomes spiritual. So, Brahmarpanam, Brahmahavir, Brahmagnal, Brahmanahutam, and then Brahmaivatena Gantavyam. The person who made the offering will undoubtedly go to the Absolute. That person will go to Krishna, will go to the Why? Brahma Karma Samadhi Na, by the Samadhi of spiritual work. Brahma Karma, Samadhi. This is very interesting. The Gita is revolutionary in its own way. The Gita is actually opening up, so to speak, the spiritual process and making it available to everyone, offering all kinds of opportunities and options. That's what Krishna is really doing. So, for example, there is a medical science in the world. But if you need help and there are no doctors, the fact that there's a medical science doesn't help you. The fact that a medical science exists in the world will not help you unless there's a medical scientist around. If your computer is broken and there's a way to fix it, but no one in your house knows how to fix it, and you can't find anyone that knows that, the fact that there is a computer science doesn't help you. And so the fact that Prabhupada brought a spiritual science will not help the world if there are not very intelligent spiritual scientists who are teaching it. That's the point. And Prabhupada said, progress means increasing the family members. We can see whether it's working or not, because Prabhupada gave that argument. When the movement was booming and people were joining, Prabhupada gave that as evidence that, that, that we're doing the right thing. Now, that's a two-edged sword. It cuts both ways. If, if the movement doing well is a sign that we're doing it right, then it seems to follow logically that if the movement's not growing in the Western world, that seems to be a sign that maybe we're not doing it right. Of course, self-criticism is not like something that this man does very often. We criticize everyone else in the world, but not ourselves so much. It's more like, yay, we're so good. Look, we've done this, we've done that. 
you know, if you work for a corporation, if you don't have regular self-critique, uh, you're going to have serious problems. So, uh, somehow or other, we have to get this job done for Prabhupada. You know, at the end of the day, we have, we have a job to do for Prabhupada. And I think that recognizing what the job is, is a big step in the right direction. Because we don't even know what the job is. We think the job is just to you know, build another temple and do another puja and, and so on and so forth. And we don't recognize what the real problem is. And there's virtually no chance we're going to solve the problem. The problem is that Prabhupada built up a powerful Western Hare Krishna movement. Prabhupada stated that his whole global strategy depended on his movement being strong in the West among Western people, and that's no longer the case. So the engine of Prabhupada's whole global strategy uh, is just not functioning properly. And so what Prabhupada really needs right now is not just, frankly, rituals. He needs someone to get this job done. That's what Prabhupada actually paid attention to. Those were the devotees that Prabhupada paid attention to. You know, it's, it, that's what Prabhupada needs. It's like, it's like that, that famous story where the... Um, I'll tell you the story from Prabhupada. It's a Prabhupada story that I experienced personally. I was, I was Prabhupada's... Well... In, in, in uh, February of 1976, I went to be Prabhupada's secretary in Mayapur the month before the festival. And, and actually, he, he, I don't think he ever asked me to do a secretarial job. He just liked to have me there and wanted to talk to me. And you know, I wasn't very called, and we just, we just wanted to talk to you about different things. And... Uh, So one time, he uh, he was a little under the weather, a little cold or something. So he was taking a bath during the, during the day. You know, he was you know, get buckets of water to load his gumption. So um, he sent his servant down to get some warm water. And so he was ready to take his bath, and the, and the servant wasn't coming back, and Prabhupada was annoyed. So I, I remember he came out onto the balcony of the Mayapur building. He said, you know, where's the water? Now the servant came back and said, oh, I found, you know, I found uh, they needed me to do this, or I had to do that. <laughs> yeah, you get <laughs> decapitated. It was, the point is, Prabhupada asked for something. And so Prabhupada's life and soul, what he lived for, was spreading his mission. And his, the fact that he had gone to the Western world and built up this powerful Western mission, that was, that was everything for Prabhupada. I mean, not, I mean, obviously he, had a, he was extremely involved in his Indian mission also, but, but that, was, that was the engine. That's what, that's what made everything run. And he used to talk about it all the time, and he put it in his Pranam Mantra. And so now that we are basically in a historical crisis, I mean, you know, you don't hear that language a lot. People come and they give talks and lectures, and, you know, they're nice devotees and they're good devotees, but you don't hear that language a lot because it's almost like it's not polite to talk like that. We should just talk about the good things. I mean, imagine a doctor that only talks about the good things. Like the patient has a very dangerous condition, but the doctor says, no, let's just talk about the good things. Someone has got to talk about, has to tell the truth, that it's a crisis. It is a, it is a historical crisis. If you are a professionally trained historian, there are different fields, you know, you can be a, you can be a, I don't know, a computer engineer, you can be a doctor, you can be this or that, but there's also a field called history. I mean, if it's not your favorite, the way it's talked, but. but anyway, there, you know, there's a professional field in which you study these things, and you see signs and symptoms, and you see where things are going. And there's even a subfield called religious history, the history of religious movements. 
and there's a history of new religious movements. And so if we study these things rationally, we are in a historical crisis. And putting our head in the sand or just, you know, this is horrible. And I mean, that's nice. It's all good. But, but just jumping up and down and banging on drums and cartels isn't going to make the crisis go away. And if we think that, well, people will automatically, I mean, it's, it's, Agata Sukriti is a real thing. It actually exists. As Prabhupada talked about it. Agata Sukriti, unknown good deed. Like we chant and, and people don't understand it, but the sound is going in their ear. They eat prasadam without knowing it's prasadam. That's all good. I'm, I'm not saying that, that that doesn't exist. I'm simply saying how much benefit is there? Is there enough benefit to make this movement work? History seems to be saying no. And it's been saying no for about over 40 years. So, and then Krishna says it. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, 1728, that any religious activity you perform, including yajna, sacrifice, if you don't really believe in what you're doing, it, the result is not very much, in this life or the next. Those are Krishna's words. And if we look at the real world, we open our eyes and see the Western Hare Krishna movement, uh, we actually have to persuade people. We actually have to attract people. The idea that we can save the world just by manipulating them. Like people don't even have to know what's happening to them. We have the power to control people, to manipulate them, to bring them where we want them to go. And it's not even required that they know what's happening. They don't even know what's going on to them. We can just overwhelm them with a gyata sukriti. We can go out and chant the street. We can get them to eat prasada. We can do all these things. And uh, we can manipulate them into Krishna consciousness. Again, I'm not saying there's no benefit in prasada. I'm not saying there's no benefit in Harinam. I'm simply saying how much benefit is it? Prabhupada, Prabhupada once wrote me a letter. I was a good host, actually. I was a good host. Prabhupada wrote me a letter, and um, he said that there's mental speculation, which we don't do, and there's philosophical speculation, which we do. And he gave this example. Krishna says, the soham, the soham I'm the taste of water. So if you speculate, is that true or not? Is Krishna the taste of water? That's mental speculation. If you accept Krishna's statement, but then you say, well, how is Krishna the taste of water? That's philosophical speculation, which Prabhupada said we can do. So I accept a Gyatu Sukriti, but I'm asking the question, how beneficial is it? How beneficial is it? Is it beneficial enough to make Prabhupada's mission a success? Is it beneficial enough so that we can just keep doing what we're doing and we're going to fulfill Prabhupada's dreams? And the world's going to become Krishna conscious. There's no evidence of that. And there seems to be a lot of evidence that it's not the case. Of course we should, but we're talking about, in this case, we're talking about trying to understand what we need to do to carry out Prabhupada's orders. So that's, and, and then we get back to the point of Desha Kalu Bhagavit, knowing where we are, knowing the local situation, understanding the difference between basic principles and details, having the intelligence, getting the mercy of Krishna to figure out a way to reach people, having enough common sense to see if some strategy is not working. Or just being honest enough not to pretend or not to just Everyone tells everyone else that everything's fine, everything's great, everything's working, there's no problem when out in the real world, the Hare Krishna movement has been long forgotten. So, uh, that's the truth as I see it. Someone may want, some people do want to debate the point. I, I talk to people all the time, devotees say everything's going great, the movement was, you know, just like it always was. And there's, I don't think there's an answer for that. Yes? 
want you to understand that what is your active response. And this is where I get this question. When you talk about studying the brain. Yes. When do you think that you have to, like, when we are practicing practice, and sometimes you are not to do this thing, but you have to do that to that extent where you can actually treat something or tell them that this is what it's doing. And sometimes I also question myself, like, I'm a practice just to balance. So, so when actually we can come to the conclusion that like, well, okay, now we have at least a Right. Well, first of all, you should apply like uh, the philosopher Kant's categorical imperative in, in the sense that you may not be doing everything, but if everyone in this country did as much as you did, this would be a liberated country. So as far as I think that let's say you're a salesman. I mean, I'm not, let's say let's say you're a salesman. If you really believe in your product, if you really believe in your product, then you go out and tell people about it. You really believe in it. You're really enthusiastic. It's like let's say, for example, you see a movie, you really like it, and you tell your friends about it. Hey, you got to see this movie. It's really good. Then, so that's a, so if. How should I put it? How could someone be in the Hare Krishna movement and not know that if you talk to someone about Krishna, it's very likely they're not going to really take it up? Or that if we go say we go out on Hari Nam, it's extremely likely that a significant number of people are not going to really like join us. And and so it's not that we don't believe in Krishna. But we have a standard presentation. We present Krishna consciousness in a certain way. And years and decades are passing. And there's not really significant, you could say, growth. It's not that you go travel around. I mean, some temples are doing well, better than others. There are some nice programs here and there. But I think it's a question of us taking the time to really think about it. Like, how do we get through to people? Not just like, okay, this is what we say, this is what we do, thinking not allowed. You just, you know, just go out and do the standard thing. And if you know, you're not, it's not, you can say, well, it's not going to work. I'm not really going to convince many people. So it makes you reluctant to do it because you kind of already know that it's not going to work. Here. And uh, I get a sense that the kind of that I have to right. it's like that may be true, but at the same and, and also it's a question of bringing we have to somehow or other break through the Western people. I mean, obviously, it's much easier with people that are your friends and are like you and you know how to talk to them. That's obviously a lot easier for all of us. All of us, for all of us, easier to talk to people that are sort of like us. But it, we have to really look at our philosophy, look at our practice and find a way to translate it. How can we, without compromising, how can we explain what we're doing? How can we explain Krishna consciousness to people, to Western people, in a way that makes sense to them, in a way that's interesting, in a way that sort of connects with, with what they're trying to do. It takes a lot of intelligence. It takes a lot of thought. And that's what we need to be doing. We need to be really thinking hard and really trying to find a way to get through to people. And But you can't get through to people if you don't know them. That's why marketing is a big thing. We don't do marketing. You know, we just sort of anecdotal. Someone saw an article somewhere. Or someone met someone somewhere. And that's that's our marketing. Yes. So we have a general question. Yes. How does one do a relation with the Papa? Because you know that he is busy, he is done process. So the question is not as some of the Islam temples has, apart from our standard with this like the Islamic temples, other temples like Islam, yes, and other temples that strictly follow and so only follow. I think Prabhupada, I think Prabhupada approved, I think Prabhupada approved 
I'm trying to think of Sita Ram, Lakshmi Hanuman, if they were installed in Bombay Juhu and probably. You know, but I would say, frankly, that's the least of our problems. Yes. In South Indians, the Bala LGBT is in a very prominent way. Yes. If you say Dharmic time, no one knows Dharmic time. So, if I put a temple... There are temples, I mean, New Vrindavan has Bala LGBT. Mm. But, but my, my question is that, do you think Prabhupada, you know... I think you should ask, actually, we have a deity worship ministry. Mm. You should ask them. I got uh, different answers from different uh, Well, but we have a deity worship ministry. So they're the ones that sort of compile all Prabhupada statements. Yeah, but that we have a ministry that deals with that. But again, that's not really ISKCON's problem. We actually have centers in South India, all over South India. And, you know, they're going on. And they're, they have nice programs. So again, that's not the problem. The problem is that Prabhupada's main program collapsed. That's the problem. And devotees, it's, it's hard to get people to focus on that. But yeah, talk to the deity worship ministry. Yes. So can you also give us uh, like a special, uh, uh, because what I see is in the education system, was I don't know if the system is like not different from the uh, Indian system, but you have to take mention about that. And I do play a specific role so to communicate with people that are here. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll repeat the question because someone wrote in such a Devi Dasi. They can't hear the comments and questions with other people. So, um, so you're asking about. Um, like difference in uh, education system. cultural differences, like educational education. systems. Yeah, but the point is, we are in America. If we go to India, we have to do everything the Indian way, right? If someone, if some, if a business person goes to India and wants to be successful or wants to go to an Indian school, you have to do it the Indian way. You can't go to India and try to do things the American way. You have to follow their rules. That's how you're successful in your career, right? I mean, you go to anywhere in the world. You have to do it the local way. How did Prabhupada, like Prabhupada was born and brought up in India and he was most of his life? Was... So, yeah, so how did Prabhupada do it? First of all, Krishna created an amazing historical situation for Prabhupada. When Prabhupada came to America and he really sort of began ISKCON in, in 66, um, Indian gurus were a huge fad in America. It, it was, you know, Indian gurus were like rock stars. So in that sense, Krishna created this very wonderful, we, because you can say, well, some, you know, purity is enough. No, actually it's not. For example, Prabhupada in India, India, the land of Krishna, before Prabhupada came to America, he was frustrated because everyone was polite and jai, samiji and all that. But he couldn't get people to take it seriously. He went to Jensi and he, he started the League of Devotees. Sort of, I guess, sort of got the name from the League of Nations he'd grown up with. And so, and then that fell through for various reasons. And then he went to back to, he went back to Delhi and uh, he printed this little sheet back to Godhead and he was giving that out. And then he, but nothing was really working as much as he wanted. I mean, it was India. So everywhere he went, it was J Jai Swamiji and Namaskar. And, you know, every, everyone was, you know, nice Hindu. But it wasn't really developing into a powerful movement. And he was frustrated. It was the same Prabhupada. It was the same Prabhupada. It's not that Prabhupada became a pure devotee on the boat. But Prabhupada didn't become pure in Butler, Pennsylvania. So here you have a pure devotee in India, but it's just not working. So the idea is that purity is enough is uh, really? Then why didn't Prabhupada have a big movement in India before he came to the West if purity is enough? 
No, it's not an you purity and having the right strategy. So if we are living in this country and or any country, but it, you know, whatever country you're living in, if you're taking all the benefits of that country and not giving back, Prabhupada said, what did he call it? He had a really derogatory word to use for No, yeah, he, he once chastised an Indian student. It was a young Indian student. And Prabhupada said, he said, you're a beggar. He said, I'm not a beggar. You just come here to take things. I'm coming to give. And so all of us, wherever we're, whether we're born here or come somewhere else, all of us were living here and receiving so many benefits, we should give back. Which means that we don't simply try to give Krishna to our little community. We try to, we try to make the country Krishna conscious. And that was Prabhupada's spirit. Prabhupada didn't come when he landed in New York City and just look for some Bengali association. And what if we probably would have come to New York and just given all his lectures at the, at the, you know, the New York Bengali Society or something? You should also write something to say that before from start, like teaching or something, you should write something. They went through a lot of, uh, they gained a lot of religious benefits uh, before they started trying to have a push. Sudan Sarasadi Maharaj is good at 100,000 rounds. Okay, so I, I'll repeat that. People can't hear the question. That that they, before they came, there was like, that broke a lifetime of preparation for Prabhupada and Bhakti Sant had chanted so much. That's true, uh, but they were always trying. But they were always trying. I just want to read some of the questions here. This is a Vraja Vanita Dasi. Why all young females, I guess devotees, are running to Mayapur to give their children Guru Kul education? Well, I mean, I guess because they really care about their children. It's, you know, when, when you have children, naturally you want to save your children. Your first duty is to save your children. So, I mean, I, I understand that. Uh, I think that if you're not just going to save your, or some people may go to Mayapur Vrindavan to save themselves. But if you don't, if your children are saved, and if you are basically okay, then just look around and see what Krishna really needs you to do. Do the needful for Prabhupada. Let me see if there's any other questions here that came in on. Uh, Um, nope. So, I guess maybe, maybe we'll stop here, but um, that's, that's what I'm focusing on, because that's what Prabhupada needs. You know, every, every devotional service is glorious, every Vaishnav is, 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 you know, should get our respect, but the fact is, there is a problem. The fact is, there. If you're, you know, if you're on an airplane and suddenly there's some problem with one of the engines, but the pilot is just, he, you know, he wants to do something else right now. Like, no, you fix the engine. If you're on an airplane and and there's a problem with the engine, you fix the engine. So there's a problem with the engine in the Hare Krishna movement. The problem is that the Western mission is um, radically reduced from what it was. That's the problem. And so what I'm, I'm appealing to devotees wherever I go. Some people like this message. Some people, of course, think that you know, it's a terrible thing to say. But, um, but my message is we need to fix this for Prabhupada and not just have, you know, feel-good programs where we just make ourselves feel good. We just please ourselves by chanting, by feasting. I mean, of course, we should be happy. I'm not saying that if you love Prabhupada, you'll be miserable. That's not my point. I mean, we should be happy in Krishna consciousness. We should chant and dance. We should do all those things. 
but ultimately it's not just the International Society for pleasing yourself and reaching out to your own little community. It's, you know, we're supposed to be establishing a powerful Western mission. And someone needs to start focusing on it. Because it is a historic, anyone who says it's not a historical crisis is just, I guess has never studied the history of religions. So anyway, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, the number to call to you know, send in those donations. <laughs> We're going to flash the number on the screen now. You can call in and uh, you know don't get on the material platform and hold something back like you have to feed your children. You know that's all. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I'm kidding. Right? So the matter. So what do you suggest? You know. Uh, Sending kids my bodies uh, better? Or uh, well, these kids are so nice. I mean, I think anywhere they go, <laughs> they'll just be great devotees. But we don't know what they're doing in the school. I know, maybe they're doing, you know, making little bombs and everything. <laughs> <laughs> Can't imagine they're doing anything. It's not good. So, uh, thank you all very much. Thank you for listening. We're going to end here. And uh, we are here in Corvallis, Oregon, being hosted by very nice devotees. And uh, Hare Krishna, wish everyone a very nice day and life in Krishna consciousness. <laughs>